In fact, he was so nice, he couldn't even be in the movie. He was so sweet. And he'd come hopping into my dressing room on the set, and he'd hop up on my dressing table, and, um, and he was just, he was just fun. It was just, you know, they're so smart. They're so smart. There was another one that particularly had a reaction to Rod Taylor. And he went after Rod continuously. <laughs> it was kind of funny, actually. This one raven, Archie, and I, I, they, there's a still of me looking terrified with a bandage on and something, and I'm looking at this bird. That's real terror. I hated that bird. That bird, every morning, if I was on the set, we were on the set together, would come over and go, Ang! and bite me. And I hated him, and he hated me. And even when we came back to the studio, and I think that shot on the veranda was taken in the studio, I'd walk in and say, is Archie working today? And they'd say, uh, I don't think so, Rod. I think we're working with the uh, seagulls. And out of the rafters would come Archie. And, you know, hated me and would lie and wait for me. And I'm sure that bird's still alive. The scene that's in the script that I understand hit shot that is not in the movie. It's a comic scene that, that's in keeping with, with their whole relationship throughout the film. And they start talking about how did this all start? And it's a, some bird in the hill who's uh, 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 some rebel in the hills gathering other birds around him. You have nothing to lose but your feathers. Let's rise up and become supreme and all that. And uh, they, they're laughing. And, and she says, but those birds came down the chimney in rage. They wanted us dead. And, and she looks at him and, and she says, I'm frightened, and he holds her or something, and then she says, why'd you have to walk into that damn pet shop? And kisses him. And the makeup was, was realized with uh, blackening out the uh, eye sockets and a buildup above the cheekbones, a wax buildup to give it a look of, of being deep set. That was also a match shot. You won't believe this, but the two eyes were painted as a mat. The makeup man would put black where the eye was, and then uh, Albert would get the print, and the black part is not, the process is not developed. And he would paint whatever he had to paint for the eyes, deep holes or whatever it is, painted them on glass, and then put that together, and that would be the result. And the audience just gasps. You know, it's wonderful. The crows are gathering behind her on the jungle gym, and I have the kids uh, singing a song and I asked my kids what's a you know they were about that school age and I said what's a song that that you sing in school and they gave me Rissledy Rossledy and I looked it up it was public domain you know it's an old folk tune that goes back forever and I used it and I gave them I don't know four or five stanzas whatever of the song the actual song and I got a call I think it was from Peggy Robertson Hitch's assistant and she said we need more lyrics for the song I said, why? She said, it won't cover the scene on the, on the jungle gym. So I wrote, uh, I don't know how many more stanzas, you know, enough to cover the whole bird kingdom arriving on that jungle gym. And they used whatever they needed. And the irony of it is that I, I still get royalties from ASCAP. For, I had to join the, the American Society of Composers and whatever it's called, publishers, ASCAP, uh, to... Uh, to, in order to allow me to use the, the lyrics in the film. And I still get royalties from ASCAP on the birds for the lyrics I wrote for that scene. There wasn't, a, you know, any birds in the sky. We again were running and fighting off birds that weren't there. So when we got back into the set at Universal, a treadmill was brought in, and the, the kids and I ran on this treadmill. Boy, we had a workout. Generally speaking, the close, a lot of the close shots, I believe, were shot on the stage in front of the sodium screen. What we had, we had the actual movement down the hill. That was the background. We had several shots. There was a side shot, a back shot. You know, because you, you need a lot of footage with, with these kinds of, of scenes so that 
the editing could be fast and it could be, you know, exciting. That was carefully choreographed. That was illustrated almost frame by frame. Because all of these, uh, they couldn't be done, you couldn't wing it. You had to know what you were doing before you started. And, it, you know, that's dangerous to be on a treadmill. I later did that on a horse in Marnie. But the treadmills can be very dangerous because if anybody falls, you know, it, it's, it could be very serious. They had, like, these bird puppets that would swoop down on us. And when we were on the treadmill, you were desperate to stay in the front of the pack because if you were the one to go down, you were like a bowling pin. And you just, boom, you were off. And they had a huge mat set up on the other end. And um, they kept getting faster and faster with this treadmill. We were running like little maniacs. I mean, down, shoo, everybody be wiped out. <laughs> And then the birds were printed in. And in some cases, it was not too difficult because those were, for the most part, black uh, crows. Hitch would say, do you think we should explain it? And we decided that it would be science fiction if we explained why the birds were attacking and that it would have a greater meaning if we never knew if it were this kind of unsettling thing that these creatures we see in the park every minute can suddenly come at our heads, you know, <laughs> if it was feeding them, it can suddenly come at us uh, with no reason. I got a call from Hitch saying, I think we need a scene that where we don't explain what's happening, but where the people involved are trying to understand what's happening so that we can proffer different Things and this was the spur for the scene in the Tides restaurant, which uh, I thought was one of the better scenes in the movie. Are the birds going to eat us, Mommy? One of the most interesting scenes uh, I think that we did was in the, the Tides restaurant and working with Ethel Griffiths, who was in her 80s, and yet she had all of these ornithological words that she had to <laughs> perform. And I, it was stunning to hear her do this. The crow is called the Sprachorynchos, and the blackbird is Euphega cyanocephagus. Thank you. And then she added that wonderful little bit where she starts to light a cigarette. And she's holding the match, and she starts spouting off all of these bird names. And you think, oh, she's going to burn her fingers, she's going to burn her fingers, which is, of course, exactly what she wanted. But she was incredible to, to, uh, to work with. I went out there to Universal and was on the set uh, the day they were shooting the exterior for the, uh, the bird attack on the man at the gas station. Look! They had a, a guy wire that the fake bird would be on to hit him on the head and move on. And they had all the pyrotechnics set for the gas to get on fire and all that. George Tomasini was uh, Hitch's editor on a number of films and uh, I was able to, to watch a lot of the editing. Of course, that in itself is just such a fantastic uh, part of, of the film. I mean, it really is everything. Everything. Hitchcock said what we need is a shot which shows everything all in one shot so that we reorient the audience. He was always thinking of the audience. So what we had to do now was to get a high shot. Some people have called it the bird's point of view, but I think Hitchcock was right. He called it God's point of view because it was an objective shot, so objective that it wouldn't be anybody's point of view. The perspective of the gas station shot was laid out by Harold Michelson, who is a, a master of, of, of architectural and, and camera perspective geometric perspective. So the whole shot was laid out very carefully for the camera position that was available. We were on the top of the uh, mountain where, where the Universal theme park is now. Uh, we were up there and we had set up a uh, big glass uh, plate. Albert Whitlock was the mad artist who was in charge of this. And we shot from the top of this mountain 
down towards the parking lot and we marked off with white paint areas where people could run, where firemen can run, and he proceeded to paint on the glass the black areas. So all the stuff that went on with the fire and everything, we had to keep in certain areas, and he painted in the whole town. I have to also realize, too, that with a matte painting, with the way Al's technique, was it was done on original negative, and that means that the original negative is preserved to the very end. It's not developed. So it's film that's never developed. So you, you only have one chance to make it right. Not like you can go back and do it over again like we do today in the computer if we... You have one chance, two sometimes, because we'd have two, two or three takes in reserve in the freezer. We'd take the film out, put it back into a camera, and add an additional exposure, which was a painting. And if it, something went wrong, that was it. But if we were going to shoot a high shot down, we had to get birds underneath us. They went to Anacapa Island to shoot the seagull part. And so the camera was set up on the cliff, looking down at the water. And they would chum the birds. Chum means that you would throw food out for the seagulls. And the seagulls would dive towards the food and that's how he got the movement of the birds seemingly flying down to the gas station. So we get a down shot on birds and then rotoscope, that is hand, make a hand painted mat for each, all these birds for each frame that they're in. Rotoscoping is a method of tracing the outline of an object that you want to isolate from its background. The rotoscope person was Millie Weinbrenner, and Millie, frame for frame, did mats and isolated those seagulls. Flashing, and I was in the phone booth. And that's another one where we went into the into the sound stage to do this scene. The phone booth is a the phone booth again is a traveling mat foreground. Sometimes outside the windows of the phone booth, sometimes you see live action. And the other angle is a full painting by Al Whitlock that has no action built into it per se. It was just designed as a background. They had supposedly shatterproof glass in there. And the seagull comes and hits the phone booth. They had the, the seagull on the wire, and it was a fake bird, of course. And the bird comes down, hits the glass, and the glass shattered and got all over my face. It was pretty scary. And we spent the afternoon taking little tiny bits of glass um, away from my skin. But after that, Rod Taylor comes and gets me, and we go into the... I, you know, was told, to, you know, in the script that she slaps this woman, and, and um, I said to the actress, I said, I, you know, I, let's, let's practice this, because, you know, so do one of those fake things. She said, no, I want you to hit me. I said, I can't do that. She said, no, you must. You must hit me. I want you to because then I, I, the reaction will be right. He's so I really have to slap her. I can hardly handle it. I think you're the cause of all this. I think you're evil, evil. The schoolhouse at the bodega, and uh, I had this marvelous idea, brilliant idea, was that if I had little magnets which I could uh, attach to the feet of the birds and put the birds on the gutter, which was metal, they couldn't fly off, and we, we had them kept there. So we, we did this, and I was up on the roof. So I went over the ridge of the roof, and I heard Hitchcock call for action, and then cut. I went over, and all the birds had, <laughs> had tried to fly off, and they all fell and were hanging upside down. I didn't know, uh, try that again. Well, the first attack on the house, you, you don't see the birds, you hear them. So we had to react to that, as any actor does, uh, when you, a monster's coming and there's no monster, you know that? Well, we had to react to the birds uh, in this terrifying attack on the house when we know that they're, they're going to kill us. Well, in order to help us all have the same degree of emotion, Hitch had a drummer come in, and he started a drum roll very, very softly, you know, that we, would, that we would hear. And then it got louder and louder and louder. In fact, Alma, all of us were almost saying, stop it, stop it, you know, just hearing the drum roll. 
which was very effective. So he sort of built up anxiety levels a bit, you know, and he would just show you the blocking of where you would be and then just took the reactions as they came. They had hammer heads, you know, with birds' heads on them and they would have these, like, hand puppets and, and all sorts of things that had bird heads on so that they could control them and stuff. And those were heads on hammers. And then they just had the prop people standing behind just beating the door so it would actually get the, the actual looking like it was ripping through. Otherwise, it wouldn't have looked, I think, like wood splitting. And uh, the scene where I go up into the bedroom upstairs is one of those scenes. They told me, Hitch always told me for the entire filming that we were going to use mechanical birds for that scene. I said, fine, don't have anything to worry about. That morning, uh, it was on a Monday morning that we were going to start the scene and Jim Brown, the assistant director, came into my dressing room on the set. And we'd known each other for a long time. And he couldn't look at me. He looked at the floor, he looked at the walls, he looked at the ceiling. And I said, what's the matter with you? And he said, we can't use the, the, the mechanical birds, they don't work. And out the door he went. And I, I just blanched white because I had seen the bird trainers with their leather gauntlets up to their shoulders and scratches that they had from the birds. And I, I walked out onto the set and there was never an intention of using mechanical birds. They had a cage built around the set so that the birds wouldn't be up in the rafters for the remainder of the shoot. And uh, there were three boxes, great big cartons of ravens and seagulls, and prop men with their leather gauntlets hurled birds at me for five days. I'll tell you, the, the, the most effective were the real birds being held. You didn't see off camera, but they were, they were birds being held by their legs. I, I don't know, maybe I put myself in sort of a zen state because it was so, it was really grisly. Because I, I literally had to fight them off. And uh, they didn't attack. I'm, the, the birds don't do that. It was just, you know, them coming at me that I would have to, you know, get away from. <laughs> Now, this was a system of fast editing that Hitchcock had been involved with for a, a long time in many other films, but that type of editing was at its height in Psycho, in the, in the shower scene. He did the same thing in The Birds with fast cuts so that you had an impression of more, almost more than was really happening. I did all sorts of angles uh, of his sketches, and he, Hitchcock had them photographed, and we sat in the screening room. When one would come on, he'd say, uh, uh, two feet, 28 frames, three frames. He would just knock them off, like he was timing it in his head. And this was amazing to me, because I'd never been involved with that kind of uh, and knowledge before, or sense of film. That Wednesday, Cary Grant came onto the set to see Hitch, and he walked over to me and he said, I think you're the bravest lady I've ever met. And I said, well, I don't know if that's the word for it. <laughs> but it was pretty horrific. By Friday, they had me on the floor, you know, because I just crumpled from sheer exhaustion as the characters being hurt. And with the holes in the dress, she would pull the elastics through, and then they would tie the foot of the bird to me. And, uh, you know, the Friday, I was that way all day, and one of the birds decided to move from my shoulder up onto my, just jumped and scratched me very close to my eye, and I said, that's enough, and I got them all off of me. And I just sat in the middle of the stage and cried. I was just totally exhausted. And uh, everybody left. <laughs> it sort of left me there. I don't remember the weekend. And um, I don't remember driving to the studio the following Monday. I got into my dressing room, beautiful dressing room. 
and lay down on the couch and my makeup man Howard Smith came uh, to get me you know for makeup and um, he couldn't wake me I was just out I mean just out just totally exhausted and I was uh, under doctor's care for a week which made it very very difficult because there were no other scenes to, to film it was sort of at the ending of the shoot oh poor thing so the scene actually when he brings her down the stairs that was a double because Tippy was in um, in the hospital from exhaustion so he carries this other lady down the stairs and then I'm sure he went back later and did insert shots of her face after that scene, you know, I was, I was really a bloody mess. And of course, the, they, they're, the makeup people are so good at that. And uh, Howard Smith had, had put scars all over me. I'll never forget when a Tippy had her head back in the chair and I was making her up and uh, putting all these peck marks on her and all of the blood and everything for the ultimate, for the bad, bad, bad one. And when I got through, she got her head up into the mirror and took a look at it. She said, pardon me, Howard, and uh, went outside and threw up. She was so taken aback by what she looked like. The illusion of movie making. You know, and indeed I had to reach off camera and open a door that wasn't there. So when I opened the door, indeed, the light came on as if the daylight was streaming in the door. And nobody in the world can say there wasn't a door there. I said, well... Aren't you going to know that there's no, no door there? And he says, but how would I be able to see you? And he said that it's all done with light. And it's true. I mean, Rod Taylor goes like this, and he pulls it, and the shadow hits it. Nobody knows there is not a door there. And he said to me, that's the magic of movies. And I mean, it's like, that was exciting. I mean, and I've never forgotten that, because it is. M movies are magic, and I think that's what made Hitchcock so special. Wasn't there something you said to me about that there was like 300 trick shots? What was it? Yes, in, uh, uh, there were 371 trick shots. Which would you think was the most difficult shot? The last shot. The last shot? That's 32 pieces of film. First of all, we had a limited number of gulls allowed. Therefore, the foreground was shot in three panel sections, left to right, up to the birds on the rail. The few gulls we had was in the first third, and we reshot it for the middle third, same gulls, and the right-hand third, gulls again. Then, just above the heads of the crows, was a long, slender middle section where the gulls were spread again. Then the car going down the driveway, the car only, with the birds each side of it, was another piece of film. Then there was the sky, and that was another piece of film. That was done mostly with uh, Al Whitlock's painting, and uh, it's a moody shot. It was also a very important shot because there really wasn't any ending to the movie. It had to be the sort of ending that led you to believe there may be something going on again, you know, or, or beyond the, the film. So that it was, in a sense, the last shot was a sort of penultimate moment, not a climax, but the time before the climax, which I think is sometimes very satisfactory as part of an art form. Hitchcock, of course, was always looking for a promotion to do, you know, that would bring um, public awareness to what he was doing, and um, very publicity-minded. So he decided that in order to get a little more publicity, he would have us swear that we would never tell the ending of the movie until it was ready to come out into the theaters. And it was kind of amusing, too, because at the point where we did that, he didn't really know what the ending was going to be. <laughs> In fact, one night, we all sat around and uh, talked about, he talked about different endings to the movie. It was fascinating listening to him, all the different versions of what, what, um, what it could be. I toyed with the idea one time of lap dissolving, and they're in the car, and they look, 
and there's the Golden Gate Bridge covered in birds. <laughs> That's marvelous. Covered. <laughs> And that would be San Francisco. Oh, my God. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, that's, that's a belly laugh. Yeah. The that was a, a surprise to me when I saw the end of the film at the Museum of Modern Art at this special uh, invitational opening. Uh, I was really enormously surprised. I, I mean, I was surprised when some scenes were not in the film, but when I saw the ending, I was shocked because the, the way I had the, the film end, uh, they come out of the house and they get in the car and they start driving away from the house. And uh, we see them coming through town now and we see the uh, havoc that has been wreaked in the town. So it becomes not just a personal thing that's directed against Melanie that wherever she is, the birds are attacking. We now see that this is a, a universal thing where we see disaster all through the town as we see an overturned school bus, we see a farmer with a a shotgun lying uh, across a front porch. We see windows shattered all over town, dead birds on the road, uh, police patrol cars uh, in flames. It's, it's almost as if a war has been waged against the town by the birds. We actually did it physically. We, we started messing up the place. What happened is I think the prop man went to some butcher place or something and got a whole bunch of uh, chickens dead chickens and we laid them all over the road and we had a lot of ketchup and we would dip rags in the ketchup and throw them against the building and uh, get a lot of blood <laughs> and uh, had a lot of this mess which the car was going to drive through and head down towards uh, uh, San Francisco. And they come to a roadblock in the road covered with birds and they they manage to get through that they creep along through that and they they start gradually accelerating the car and moving away and the birds all go up in the air and come at the car and now they're going out of town on that same winding road and the birds now are coming on a straight line for the car and the birds descend on the car and the convertible is also set up at the very beginning of the film it's a convertible with a canvas top and now the birds land on the top of the car and they're in the car, and we see the, the top starting to shred, and it goes back suddenly, and all the birds are hovering over the car. And we go back and we see that the road now is, the curves are ending, and he hits the gas, and the car goes ahead, and the birds fall back. We see the birds falling back, and they're in the clear. And that, that was the end of the movie. And certainly the car chase survived to whatever draft was in the production script. And it's, it was gone. And uh, I, I think, I don't know what happened. I know that, I know for sure that that sequence would have taken him a month to shoot. Overhead shots, special effects with the birds over the, the roof getting, well, the roof was easy, but all the rest cutting away from the winding road to helicopter shots, all this stuff would have been just impossible to shoot. Just impossible. And I think maybe he figured he had the same effect by showing the birds having taken over the, the screen and by association the world. We had a long discussion about uh, music and a score, using a score, you know. And uh, I felt that uh, it would really um, make the movie almost unbearable if we had music in it and, uh, you know, underscoring the terror and adding to the screaming of the birds. I, I think the audience would have jumped out of their seats. And he said, no, he felt it would be more effective the other way. It would appear that Hitchcock first became interested in using electronic sounds in place of score for the birds in uh, April of 1962 when he received a letter from a man in Germany named Remy Gassman. Gassman was the co-designer of something called the Studio Tritonium. This was a device created by uh, another man, I believe his name was Dr. Frederick Trautwein, and it basically was the forerunner of many modern keyboard instruments in that it was able to take sounds, commonplace, ordinary sounds, and by playing the keyboard or playing the instrument, you could manipulate the sounds. 
Gassman contacted Hitchcock and alerted him to the fact that there was this creation. It had been used by the New York City Ballet, and uh, it would allow Hitchcock to manipulate sounds in a way that, uh, that could be very musical in effect. This was intriguing to Hitchcock, and he brought it to Bernard Herrmann's attention. One might think that Bernard Herrmann would be angry that he would not be writing music for the film, but Herrmann was intrigued by this invention and uh, its application on the birds. So Hitchcock and Herrmann traveled together in 1962 to West Berlin to meet uh, Remy Gassman and to uh, explore the possibility of using the studio tritonium in the film. It was a very happy trip, and uh, later Herman regarded it as one of the, the most pleasant times that he ever spent with Alfred Hitchcock personally. They got along very well, and uh, they were both uh, very impressed by the results of this machine. So from that point on, Herman became basically an advisor on the film, a consultant, to work with both Hitchcock and Remy Gassman and decide where they wanted to use this effect in the place of where they would have used a conventional score. Secondly, he creates a, a kind of almost final note uh, by increasing the sound of those birds uh, under the final shot. And it's very ambiguous as to whether they're on the verge of another major attack or, or if this is just a sort of, you know, almost psychological effect. So this very experimental technique that they used did in fact turn out to be very successful. And uh, Herman and Hitchcock were both apparently very pleased with the result. You know, because birds are so common, I mean, you, you see them all the time, you think of them as basically being your friends. But after doing the birds, yes, you did start looking at birds a lot differently. I've never seen so many crows on our front yard as... I never knew there were that many of them until after doing this movie, and you, you started looking at them a lot differently. I was totally overwhelmed. I thought it was wonderful. Not necessarily with me, not at all. But with the, the story, I was captivated by the story. You know, I just lost me altogether. But I thought it was just a magnificent piece of film genius. And he took from every technical facet of our industry to make it work. I was, I was thrilled about it. I was um, and totally amazed about it. Of course, there was a, a master who was directing. And um, it is a kind of Judgment Day film. It also basically says that, you know, it's all going to go back to Mother Earth. Uh, she will prevail. It's the end of the world! It scared me when I saw it, and I'd been on the set, and I knew, I knew all the different things. But uh, it, it was a great movie. I think it's one of his best.